Hello and welcome to the first lecture of 2020 in the Geotape series. We're very pleased today to have Jean-Daniel Boissonnat who will tell us about Delaunay triangulations and manifolds. I believe Jean-Daniel will have a couple of times so he'll pause and ask for questions. So get your questions ready and Jean-Daniel, take it away. Thank you very much. So thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to give this talk and thanks for the introduction. Hello, everybody. So today I would like to talk about Dolonet triangulations of manifolds. And my talk will cover a collection of results we obtained um, uh, in the, say, five last years in collaboration with uh, essentially three persons who like to thank Arigit Gauche, Ramsey Dyer, and Matthijs Wintriken. And most of the work has been done within the framework of some European ERC project named GUDI, uh, which stands for Geometry Understanding in Higher Dimensions. So, as you know, triangulations of manifold is a huge topic in, in mathematics, in topology, and um, it has been extremely well studied and was initiated by Poincaré was the question whether any topological manifold can be triangula triangulated. And since then, uh, a lot of major results by great mathematicians, I just put some of them on the slide. And um, the, the question was essentially an existential question. Uh, does all um, manifolds triangulable? The, but some of the some of the results, especially the ones by Whitney, who is on, shown on the, on the slide, were of, uh, say, um, uh, constructive nature. It was not really an algorithm, but uh, at least there was part of it, and we will use part of the result of Whitney to, to in our own work. So this was the topology called side of triangulations, but there is also a more, say, geometric side, and uh, Dolonet triangulations play a major role in that, in that direction. So Delaunay triangulations were invented by Delaunay in 1934. And since then, they have been used uh, widely. And in computational geometry, especially, with this, these are one of the most basic objects that has been studied and used also in many applications. So the questions there are, um, well, to try to construct good triangulations, good, nice elements, um, say good angles, short edges, thickness, and this is also in relation with peer approximation of functions. So can we define a triangulation with good properties in this respect, the approximation? And there is another side of the topic which is related to combinatorics and algorithms. How many Simplices uh, are there in the Delaunay triangulation of endpoints? Can we, uh, well, get um, also effective construction and what is the complexity of the algorithms and, and so on and so forth? And these are the type of questions that we would also like to, to uh, study in this talk. And as probably you know, there are many applications essentially in three dimensional space for mesh generation, manifold learning in higher dimensions. And um, I would like to consider some of these applications. So there are essentially three parts in my talk. And the, say the second and the third part are about manifolds. And the, the first part, the, the second part will be about manifold reconstruction, which uh, essentially consists in um, given a set of points that have been taken from that sample some manifold, some sub-manifold of Rd, D possibly large, can we compute some uh, triangulation of the points that is a good approximation of the unknown manifold? And since the application in that area are also in high dimensions, uh, especially in for machine learning applications, uh, the main concern will be to, uh, to have algorithms with Depend, complexity depends, um, does not depend much on the ambient dimension that can be very large. The, 
the, the other case of manifold will be, say, Riemannian manifolds. Um, and since Dolan triangulations are well uh, suited for uh, constructing triangulation in metric spaces, this is a good place also to look at Dolan triangulation in this context. And the question is, do, uh, do uh, Riemannian manifold admit uh, Delaunay triangulations under what conditions and this kind of question. And application there are uh, related to mesh generation, especially when the phenomena you have to, to simulate has some anisotropy, like in um, fluid mechanics, for example. Okay, so this is the context. And in both cases, either for submanifolds of Euclidean space or for Riemannian manifolds, what we will do is to construct local, oh, sorry, local triangulations, um, local Delaunay triangulations, and then we will make these compatible. So we will have an atlas of local triangulations. And by looking at the stability of the triangulation in these local charts, we will be able to glue them together to get uh, a combinatorial manifold with nice properties. So this is the overall goal. And to do that, we need to, to, to study the uh, st stability property of the linear triangulations. And so this is the first part of the talk. So I will start with some very uh, uh, quick, um, um, will remind you what are the linear triangulations very briefly some extension to weighted or Lagier geometry, and then look at these uh, good triangulations and how to construct them. Okay, so let's start. So donut triangulations are defined from Voronoi diagram that can be defined in any metric space. So in the Euclidean case, as it is shown here, you have a finite set of points, the red points, say the sides, and then you associate to each point the point of the space which are which have a given closest red point. So this each cell is a convex polytope. So the all points in this cell are have this red point as its closest uh, side. And then this is a subdivision of the of the space into convex cells which are um, polytopes. And if we look at the nerve of this Voronoi diagram we get the so-called Delaunay complex. Okay, so, uh, so we have a triangle in the triangulation. If there are, in, in this case, if we have three Voronoi cells that meet at the, at the point, which is the circumcenter of the circumscribing circle of the triangle. And this also, of course, uh, works in any dimension. So the the Delaunay complex can equivalently be defined as the, the simplicial complex whose elements can be circumscribed by an empty ball. There is no point closer than these three points to this point. And Delaunay's theorem is that provided that the points satisfy some non-cosphericity condition, I will just explain, this this is the triangulation of the point set. You can realize this abstract triangulation as a triangulation embedded in the in in the in the space RD where the points are defined. And the condition says that there is no subset of the point of the red points, no subset of size d plus two on the same hypersphere. So in the plane, that means no four points in the same circle. Okay, so provided this genericity condition is satisfied, then the Lunar triangulation is really a triangulation. It fills the convex all of the points with simplices. And there is a very well-known and very useful construction that consists in lifting the points in some d plus one dimensional space, and then uh, reduce the problem of uh, computing the Lunar triangulation or well, show that the Delaunay triangulation is just the projection of some polytope. So what you, you can do is you take your, your original space here as the, the horizontal plane, you lift the points 
on the paraboloid. So the last coordinate is just pi squared. And then you take the convex cell of these points, the lower part of the convex cell of the points, this is, of course, a convex polytope, and the faces will project on the original space as a triangulation if the points are in general position, which is exactly the same condition as the one I mentioned before, and you will get a triangulation. And here, if you use the polarity, the usual, usual duality between polytopes, the convex hole will, um, will be uh, replaced by the intersection of half spaces, and then you get another polyhedron whose projection, if you project the faces of polyhedron down in the original space, you get the Voronoi diagram. So on one, here you have the nerve as we define the Delaunay triangulation, but if you go up, you have a polytope. By duality, you get the convex hull, and then uh, you project the, this convex hull, you get the Delaunay triangulation. And provided that the points are in general position in the previous sense, no d plus two points on the same sphere, then uh, all simplices here are, all faces of the convex hull are simplices, and they project down uh, as a triangulation. So this observation, which is very well known, has many consequences. And one is that we can bound the complexity of the Voronoi diagram or the lunar triangulation. And this is because of the um, upper bound theorem of MacMillan that bounds the number of faces of all dimensions of a polytope in d-dimensional space. So if you have a polytope in d-dimensional space, say the convex cell of n points, um, uh, so in our case, it's the convex cell of n points lifted in Rd plus one, then the complexity, the num total number of phase of all dimensions is n to the ceiling of d over two. So it's exponential in d. So in low dimensions, this is fine, but in high dimension, it's pretty bad. and even if we consider the case we will consider later of points lying on some manifold, submanifold of low dimension, uh, it doesn't improve the complexity. For example, the worst case can be obtained if you put points on some curve, the moment curve parameterized like this. And in three space, you can see that if you put points on two non-parallel lines, uh, you get a quadratic bound. So even if the points lie on very uh, low dimensional objects, the complexity can be very bad. So the other, the algorithmic uh, aspect of this is that you can compute the Delaunay triangulation or Voronoi diagram by first computing the convex hull and then projecting the, the, the result down in the, to the original space. And the complexity, if you use Clarkson and Shaw randomized algorithm or Chazelle deterministic algorithm, much more complicated, you get an optimal bound, which is n log n plus n ceiling of d over two. Okay, so this is the complexity for computing Voronoi diagrams in the worst case complexity for computing Voronoi diagrams in this space. I would like also to mention very briefly an extension of this diagram, which is almost as simple as the Euclidean diagrams, Voronoi diagram and the lunar triangulation, which is extremely, would be, be extremely important in the, in, in the rest of the talk. And this is the case of, say, weighted points or balls. So uh, you associate to a point PI, a weight, WI, you can, if WI is positive, you can consider this as the, the square root of the radius of a ball. So we can consider the weighted point as a ball. And you have a finite set of such weighted points and you define the distance from a point X to a weighted point as the power, which is the square distance from X to PI squared minus the weight, right? And if you, you look at this, you can define, so it's not the distance, but you can define Voronoi uh, Voronoi's diagram using this um, this uh, capital D uh, like distance, and and you this is an affine diagram. All cells are convex polytopes, exactly as in the case of Euclidean Voronoi diagram. 
And in fact, there is, and you can define the associated Dulunet triangulation. So this is called usually the weighted Dulunet triangulation. We can define it as the nerve, and you have a very similar result, uh, result very similar to the Dulunet's result that says that if the points, weight of the points are in some general position, then uh, their Dulunet triangulation can be realized as triangulation of the point set in, in the RD. And the condition is that uh, there is no point in RD with the same power with respect to D plus two weighted points. So it's the analogous of the condition, the cosphericity condition. And lastly, we have exactly the same construction as the Euclidean case. We lift the points, but now the weight plays some role. So we move the points along on uh, the last direction by some amount, which is the weight, and the, but the construction is exactly the same. So now we have points in higher dimension space. We can compute the convex hull, and the projection will be the triangulation of the weighted points. Okay, so it's an extension of the usual Euclidean case to weighted points, and we will play with that in, in, in the uh, later in the talk. But the important point is that because these are the fine diagrams, their cells are convex polytopes, there is the same construction. They can be computed as easily as um, coronal diagrams. Okay, so that was to just basic facts about Dolonet triangulations and their weighted uh, extension. And now I will like to talk about good triangulation because this is very central uh, in, in, the, in the rest. So there are several aspects in, good, in this notion of good triangulation. And I think it's easy to understand from the, the, the manifold triangulation perspective that we will need some sampling conditions. So we need that this, the vertices of the, of the point set, the size, the vertices of the triangulations satisfy some nice density property. And this is, uh, this is uh, what uh, is called an, a net, an epsilon net. So a net is simply a set of, finite set of points. <clears throat> so if you look at the a net inside this ball, it's a set of points uh, such that there is no point inside the ball uh, which is a distance greater than epsilon from a sample point, the sample. And two sample points can, cannot be too close together. So there is a density condition and the separation condition. So I will call separation the minimum distance between any, any two points. And we just say that we have an epsilon net if the, the separation is um, constant times the, the, the sampling radius epsilon. Okay, so epsilon net exists, and this is an interesting exercise. And the, the nice property is that if you assume that your point set is a net, uh, so to avoid boundary um, effects, I just look the flat torus of dimension D, um, then it's easy to see that inside the, the, the since the since the Delaunay simplices are circumscribed by, by empty balls, they are um, the circumradius of any simplex, D simplex, cannot be larger than epsilon, right? Because we have an epsilon net. And since the, um, it's a net, there are not too many points inside your ball of radius. Uh, so, so if you look at the star of any point in the triangulation, there are distance at most two epsilon from the point, say the star P. All the neighbors are at distance at most two R, and they cannot be closer than, say, epsilon because we have this separation condition. So this, if you just use a volume argument, you get that the number of simplices of all dimensions is now 2 to the O of D squared times the number of points. So it's a linear bond if you assume that D is uh, a constant, which is, of course, very different from the exponential bond we had before. And we can also extend the algorithm uh, the, the usual <clears throat> randomized construction and show that it will run in this uh, with this complexity. Okay, so 
re remember that in the case of nets, we have much better bound than in the in the general case. Second uh, question is about the quality of the simplices. So we don't want simplices that are, say, flat. And uh, we will see why this is important. And to measure this, th there are several notions which are more or less equivalent. So what I use here is the thickness, <coughs> which is defined as uh, so first we define the altitude, which is the distance from a point from a vertex to the opposite uh, face. And then we define the thickness as the minimum of the altitude divided by the diameter. And there is a J factor here. This is just for to simplify some calculations. So just remember that this is <coughs> the the minimum altitude divided by the, the diameter of the simplex. Okay, so this is small when the simplex is uh, is flat. Okay, so this sounds like a good measure. And <clears throat> this is in fact an, a notion that has been used in many places in mathematics, in differential topology, geometry, general function, and of course also in mesh generation because <clears throat> precision of the computation that we can do is related to this, uh, to the thickness of the simplicity. So this is really a central concept. And the question of computing a thick triangulation is uh, pretty important. In our context of approximately manifolds, uh, it can be also um, uh, seen that this is an important concept so we, this is a uh, lemma, a small lemma due to Whitney, and he considered as a simplex sigma, whose vertices all lie within a distance delta from some k-dimensional fine space. So in, in future, in the later part of the talk, H will be a tangent space to a manifold. And what is said here is that the sign so the angle, the sign of the angle between the fine hull of the simplex and H is at most this quantity. Well, delta is the, the distance here, theta is the thickness, and delta is the diameter. And this is very important. If you look at this example on, in, in three space, this is known as the schwarz lampion um, long term. You may have a very dense sample, arbitrarily dense sample, but the angles between the facets and, uh, say, the, 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 the tension space to the manifolds are arbitrary far away, by 90 degrees. And, but this is not possible if the simplices are thick. Okay, so this is um, an important property. So are the lunar triangulation thick? Well, if you look at the 2D case, the answer is yes. If you have a net, so the, the, circum, the circum radius is at most epsilon by the uh, sampling condition, and the distance between two points is at most, well, something which is uh, well, constant times epsilon. So it's easy to see that the, 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 the angles of the triangle are lower bounded. So yes, in the two-dimensional case, the triangulations of nets are thick. But unfortunately, this doesn't hold in higher dimensions. And here is a very simple example. You have a grid. And if you look at the square in the face in this grid, which is a square, there is a, a ball that circumscribes this, this, uh, this square. And this ball does not contain any other points. So if it's a Dolonet ball. And if you slightly perturb the points, this ball will remain empty and we, you will have a tetrahedra made of these four points, non-degenerate tetrahedra, which is arbitrarily flat. So if you do compute the Dolonet triangulation of a grid, then uh, uh, you will find simplices that are arb arbitrarily uh, flat. Okay, so uh, we have to do something. And the way we will 
um, proceed is by extending the genericity condition we have def Delaunay has defined for his uh, theorem. So you remember we know four points on the same circle in the plane and the same analogous condition in higher dimensions. So here we will quantify this uh, gener genericity and define the protection as we will say that there is a delta protection uh, the delta, the Delaunay triangulation is delta protected if uh, if you look at the circumscribing ball of the simplex uh, and extend it by delta in the sh there is no point in the shell between the two balls the balls have radius the radius the circumscribing radius of the simplex and the same uh, the radius plus delta okay. So the Delaunay condition was for delta equals zero, but here we want some positive delta, and we call that protection. And it's easy to see that if you have protection, you have separation. Of course, there is no two points which can be a distance le less than delta. And moreover, there is some thickness. This is not a very good bound, but you can see that if you have a blue Delaunay circle here, which is protected. So there is no point inside the, 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 the big blue ball. Then if you have a neighboring um, triangle, and here is its circumscribing circle, the last vertex, well, there are two common vertices here, but the last third vertex cannot be in this uh, small strip because it cannot be inside the, the shell, the blue shell. Okay, so this implies some uh, some thickness bound. And now we have some results about uh, uh, stability of the linear triangulation. Okay, so if uh, the result is the following, uh, if we have if we perturb the vertices uh, of the of a simplex, which by some rho amount at most. And if okay, and if the radius of the, the Delaunay balls is less than epsilon, which is implied by the net epsilon net condition, and if the minimum distance between two points separation is greater than this quantity, and if the simplex is thick enough, so thickness is lower bounded by this quantity, positive quantity. And if the perturbation is not too big, of course, then the distance between the circum center can be bounded. Okay, so it's bounded by rho divided by some constant. And from that, and the protection, since the, the circum center cannot move by too much, and we have some protection, then we can guarantee that the triangulation of the perturbed points P uh, tilde uh, P, is the same as the Delaunay triangulation of the initial points. Okay, so uh, so this is the stability property that will be crucial. So the question is now: um, can we can we perturb the points so that we make we can make the, the, the triangulation stable, given any triangulation? Okay. Uh, I, I should also add that this here, the perturbation is on the position of the points, but we can also do something, have the very similar results if we perturb the metric. So in particular, if you, we use weights, as I, I mentioned in the beginning, if we weight the points, so we don't move the points, we just add some weight to the point, then we have a very similar result. Okay, so now, uh, how can we effectively uh, make a triangulation protected? So the, the idea is the following. We look at the simplex that is not protected, and we call that a bad, so the simplex plus this red point, which is inside the shell, we call that a bad configuration or a bad event. We don't want such uh, configurations. So if we remove all such configurations, then we will have 
um, a protected uh, set. So the idea is to perturb the points so that we don't have this configuration. And the algorithm is extremely simple. You associate to each point a picking ball, and we will pick randomly uh, and independently a point in each of the balls. Not all the balls, but the balls associated to the bad configurations. So precisely, we have a net in, uh, in say, the flat torus. Uh, rho is the perturbation. Delta is the protection. And while there exists a bad configuration, which is simplex and the point inside the shell, we resample the points of the, of the configurations. That is, we pick new, uh, new points inside the picking uh, balls at random. And we do that as long as there exist bad configurations. And the miracle is that this will end and this will end very fast. So in the end, we will have uh, under some condition, of course. And, and this will uh, result in a triangulation of a perturbed set, set of points, which, is, which has some protection. Okay, and in fact, the, this is a variant, or this is an application of a very uh, well-known result and algorithm. So the, 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 it's based on the, the local Lovas lemma, and it's a constructive version due to Moser and Tardos. And um, so they gave some condition. So you have to bound the probability that one of these event or bad configuration happens. And then you, want, you need to bound this probability with respect to gamma. And gamma is a bound of the number of events that are, say, um, that are you need that there are some dependency between the events, of course, because a configuration has common points with other configurations. So there are correlations between all of these events. But you want that a configuration is independent from all, almost all other events except gamma. So you have a bond on the, the way, uh, on the dependency between the events. And provided you have a bond here and you can guarantee that the probability that an event is less than one over E, where E is the basis of logarithm times gamma plus one, then you are sure that the algorithm will terminate and associate it, assign values to variables so that no bad event can happen. And there are some bounds, which are these ones, so the expected bounds. So it's a randomized algorithm and you, very simple one, and of course, the, 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 the proof is uh, that this result is uh, much more complicated than the, just the algorithm. But what I will show you is that it's pretty simple to have these conditions satisfied in our case. So one is to bound the probability that we have a bad configuration. So we look at the simplex and the point which is in, inside the shell, and we perturb the points by taking, and we want to know what is the probability that by picking a point inside this blue ball of reduced rho, we, we, uh, the point falls into the, the yellow part of this blue ball. Okay, so this is just a matter of computing volumes of balls and shells, and it turns out that, so the, the probability is then the, the ratio between the volume, the bad probability, the probability that the bad event happens is the probability is the ratio of the volume of this yellow part of this over the volume of the blue ball. And it's easy to see that this is T delta over rho. Okay, the volume of the ball is rho to the D and the volume of the, uh, the yellow part is um, at most delta times rho to the D minus one. So we get something which doesn't depend on the other points. And uh, so this is the probability of the bad events. So this is the first part, the analysis. And the second part is to bond the dependency gamma. But this is easy because since we have a net, all the balls 
dolinibols have radius at most epsilon. And so, and two uh, configurations are not independent if they share at least one vertex. So they cannot be too far apart. So again, by using uh, some volume um, calculation, we can, we can see that gamma is bounded by a constant. It doesn't depend on epsilon. It depends on, on these constants. It depends and on D, of course. So the dependency on D is two to the D squared, so it's pretty big, but it doesn't depend on epsilon. Okay, and then then we just have to uh, use these um, these um, bounds into the local uh, local Lovas lemma, and we see that if this is satisfied. This condition which depends on gamma, which just uh, bounded, and the, 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 these quantities, delta is the um, protection, uh, rho is the perturbation radius, eta is the separation, uh, and this holds if delta is small enough. So the protection we get is very small, but still we get something, and, uh, and as a result, we obtain a there are two points P prime whose distance from P is at most the perturbation radius, and all the simplices have some delta protection and some thickness. And this protection and thickness does not depend on epsilon. They are this type. And the complexity of the algorithm is just uh, as Moser and Tardos uh, uh, have proved is linear in the number of events, but in our case, because of this bounds of nets, it's linear in the number of points. Okay, so in time linear in the number of points, uh, we can construct a new uh, point set, which also is a net, not exactly epsilon, but it's uh, close to epsilon net, um, and, uh, which is thick. Okay, so as I said, uh, you can use various uh, perturbation uh, method for the, the to get this kind of result. You can weight the points, so which is the same as which is the way to perturb the metric. So use the weighted Delaunay triangulation instead of the the usual Delaunay triangulation. Or there is another technique which is also uh, pretty useful in some contexts is to refine the point set. So you refine the point set by inserting new points and you verify at each insertion that you, uh, you don't create any bad configuration and you can prove that this is possible. Okay, so the nice point is that we get, we got quantified bounds, but they are quite weak. And the question is um, whether we can do better than this. And this type of result have also applications in uh, three dimensional generation where slivers, flat simplices are, uh, are, are to be avoided. Okay, so now uh, let's go to the, 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 the second part. And um, so maybe if there are questions, I can make a short pause. Uh, we'll move to some manifolds and uh, Okay, so please, if you have questions, just interrupt me. So now I will uh, show how we can use these uh, results for manifold reconstruction. So we need some um, restriction on the class of manifolds we can uh, we can reconstruct, and this this, this this is the regularity condition, which is defined uh, here uh, in terms of the reach. So the reach has been introduced by Federer in uh, 1958 and rediscovered many times. So it's very natural um, quantity. So given some objects, the manifold, the black curve in this case, we uh, the, 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 the reach, well, we can consider the medial axis, which is the set of points of the space with at least two closest neighbors. Any point on the blue curve 
as two closest points on the, two distinct closest points on the on the on S. So this is the medial axis, and the reach is just the distance from any a point on S to the medial axis, the minimum of some uh, distance. So you can call the local feature size. You can use also the local feature size, which is a, say a local variant of this. But I won't talk about this. So the, so the reach is just the distance from the minimum distance between the point of S and the medial axis. So you can see that for any point at distance at most to reach from S, um, any such point has a unique closest point on the manifold. And also an important observation is that the reach is small in places where the curvature is large, like here, but also in places where the so there is a kind of bottleneck between two portions of the of the of the manifold. Okay, so so it's really the curvature, but it also also has some global aspect, which of course will be very useful for topological properties. Okay, and then we can define uh, nets based on this notion. So we will have to set, so we call it epsilon eta net. Uh, we need the covering property that, um, that says that any point on M, so, well, S and M should be the same. So any point on, on the manifold, on the submanifold, uh, has to be a distance at most epsilon times the reach from a sample point. And it, any two points in the sample should be at distance at least eta times the reach. And if eta is of the same order as epsilon, we call that an epsilon net. So from this uh, uh, notion of reach and uh, density, we can uh, get easy uh, geometric observations. So if we look here at two types of projections, one is to project onto the tangent space, I call it TP, tangent space at P, and here is the projection on the manifold. So if we look at this, so this is the figure on the, on the left. Um, so the manifold is the red curve, but because the reach is this quantity, we know that the ball uh, centered at P and tangent to the manifold at P of radius reach, the reach, does not contain any point because of the definition. And so uh, the red ball has to be, say, below the, the, the ball, from which we deduce immediately by easy calculation that the angle between the, the segment PQ and the tangent space is at most this quantity. And the distance between the point and its projection onto the, onto the tangent space is at most this quantity. Okay, so we can bound the distance between the point and this projection onto the tunnel space. And from that, we can also deduce that if we have a simplex of diameter delta uh, less than the reach, then the distance from X to its uh, projection onto the manifold, so the closest point of X, which is unique because of this condition, uh, onto the manifold X prime, uh, is less than this quantity. This is simply by applying the previous result. So I won't detail this. This is very elementary calculation, but just to give you a flavor of what we can get, some geometric property we can get using a uh, manifold with a bounded reach. And if you remember the Whitney, Whitney's uncle bound, we can just translate the result in our context when we take H Remember, we have the simplex, j-dimensional simplex with points uh, which are close to a tangent space, a, a fine space, and we will take this affine space to be the tangent space at the point. Then we use the distance we just get from the previous lemma, and we see that the sign, uh, the angle between the, the affine hull of the simplex and the tangent space at P, one of its vertices, is bounded by this quantity. So again, it's bounded by the diameter of the simplex, the thickness of the simplex, and the reach of the manifold. 
Okay, so it gives you uh, an idea why this reach is so important. We have a control on, on the distance between the point and its projection, and we also have a, a bound on the, on the angles between the facets of the triangles and the facets of the triangulation and the, um, and the tangent space at the vertices of the triangulation. So now let's go to the reconstruction problem. So the problem is given uh, an object that is sample. So you only you don't know the object, but you know a finite set of points that sample the object. Then you can well the usual uh, way to reconstruct the shape is to construct to replace the points by balls of some radius. The R, and then from the balls, the union of balls, you construct a simple cell complex. And you want to reconstruct, uh, say, uh, an approximation of the object. So there are, of course, various ways to do that. And uh, I will just simply recall some basic results. And uh, one is by Nyogi, Smale, and Weinberger. And they proved that if you have uh, a submanifold of positive reach, tau, and a dense epsilon sample in the previous sense. And if the radius of the ball alpha is, say, larger than a few times epsilon and smaller than some fraction of tau, then the union of the ball centered at the points P, or the, or the point centered at the points of the points at P, is homotopy equivalent to the submanifold. So if we go back to this figure, this means that here we have something in the case of submanifold, which is homotopy equivalent to uh, to the original object we don't know. Okay, and this result has been extended to general compact sets by extending the notion of reach. I, I won't dis discuss this, but just let um, mention it. And they'll also be generalized to the, well, we replace the distance function by uh, something that can be robust to outliers, the distance to, to measure. OK, but I, I won't talk about this, just to mention that there are extensions. And then when we have this union of balls, we can look at the nerve of this union of balls, get the check complex, and Lohe has proved that the check complex has the same homotopy type as the union of balls. So if we look at the entire chain pipeline, then we have, from the point set, we have union of balls, which has the same topology, same homotopy type as the manifold, and then we have a combinatorial structure, uh, check complex, that has the same homotopy type as the union of balls. So as, as the, the submanifold itself. And we can do that using also the Dolone complex. So instead of using the, the covering by the balls, we can use it by the, the Dolone cells of the balls. Okay, so I won't discuss this um, uh, in detail, but what I want to, 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 to say is that the sizes of this check and Dolunay complex depend exponentially on the ambient dimension. So they are very big, uh, even if the points lie on low dimensional structure, as I mentioned previously, they are very difficult to compute in, in high dimensions. So it's, this is really a problem. And moreover, uh, we only get, uh, as a result, that the, the, the complex has the same homotopy type as the original object, but it's not a triangulation, it's not homeomorphic to the to the original object. Okay, so uh, so the question is, can we do better if we consider submanifolds instead of more uh, general objects? And in particular, we are interested in the case where the, the dimension of the submanifold is, which I call K, is much smaller than the dimension D of the ambient space, which is a usual case in machine learning, say, data analysis. So we would like to bound the combinatorial complexity as a function of the intrinsic uh, dimension. And also, so this is the complexity aspect, and also we want to get something which is really a triangulation, homeomorphic to the submanifold. 
And so we want to compute a combinatorial complex, a combinatorial, sorry, manifold that is a simply cell complex such that the link of any vertex is a K minus one a dimensional uh, sphere. And the idea is to, uh, to use local triangulations, a very natural idea in differential geometry. So we, we will compute local triangulations, local stars, and then we will make them compatible because usually this is not the case as it is shown on the right side here, the red and the blue uh, stars are not compatible. They don't share triangles. And the problem can also be expressed by the fact that a simplex, uh, some simplex do not appear in the stars of all their vertices. Okay, so uh, the blue triangle here does not appear in the star of Q. So if we can do that, if we can make this local triangulation compatible, and we will do that by using the previous results by perturbing the points, then we will have compatible stars and we can stitch them to get a combinatorial uh, manifold. And we will also show that this is really a triangulation. So I'm afraid that time is running, but I just want to, to, to mention that uh, the idea here is um, to use what we call the tangential complex, which has been uh, invented by independently by Friedman and um, my student Flototo, and then fully analyzed in a paper with Arigit Gauche. So the, the idea is, is simple. You will look at the uh, restriction of the Delaunay triangulation to the tangent space, and you will do that at all the points. So what is the restriction? So here is the tangent space. You look at this point and uh, you take the Vonoi uh, spaces that intersect the tangent space, which are in bold red. The other ones are dotted. And then you take the dual faces in the triangulation, which are the bold faces here. And then you just take the star. So it's here it's the same except that we just take the star of the point P where we took the tangent space. And this is the local star. So the local star is a subset of the full dimensional Delaunay triangulation. And we collect all, but it's of dimension K because the tangent space is, is of dimension K. So in general, it's, it's of dimension K. And so we collect all these K simplices, all the stars. And this is what is called the tangent cell complex. And there are, um, and what we can prove is, uh, in fact, the collection of results that provided that M is a manifold of rich, a positive rich, and P is a net of this manifold for some sufficiently small epsilon. Then the output, uh, when we apply this perturbation technique is, uh, so M hat is the Delaunay triangulation of the perturbed points. We should put prime here. For epsilon small enough, there exists some thickness, positive thickness such that M hat is a combinatorial manifold of dimension K. It's included in a tube around the submanifold of this size. This is just because the size of the Delaunay balls are less than two epsilon. Um, and all simplices are theta not thick, and the angles between the facets are satisfied the previous bound. And uh, also we have a global result. The uh, M hat is a triangulation of M. Okay, I will briefly go back to these questions. So, uh, and these points, and the complexity of the algorithm is uh, is linear in uh, in the ambient dimension. Oh, so, sorry, 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 sorry. The, 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 well, the complexity is this one. So the complexity is, uh, th this quadratic term is uh, due to the computation of the distances between the points and could be improved. And the 
so it's kind of pre-processing and then you have to compute all these uh, local stars and glue them together and this can be done in this time complexity which is linear in the total number of points uh, so I'm sorry I made a mistake so here it's not D it's it's K sorry about this so the, so the complexity so uh, so the complexity is linear in the ambient dimension d and it's only exponential in k so here it should be k okay uh, so this is a nice trick but due to uh, time constraint i will skip it but the the, the the nice thing is that we can compute the um, local star without computing the full dimensional delaunay triangulation. And this is just because if you look at an affine space, the intersection of d dimensional Voronoi diagram with a k dimensional affine space is a weighted diagram, a Laguerre diagram in this affine space. So what we have to do is just to, and this is just because of Pythagoras theorem, very simple. And, and what we have to do is to project the points onto the tangent space, and then we construct the weighted Delaunay triangulation in this tangent space, and we just have to, to, to and this is the result. We just have to look at the, so it's computed in the tangent space, but we look at the lifted version of this, the, the, the using uh, the original points, and we get the star. And so we can compute all the stars since we have n stars in this complexity. So again, this should be k. Okay, and the last thing is that we can show that um, that m hat is a combinatorial uh, uh, combinatorial uh, manifold, and this is easy to understand because the star at each point is a local triangulation, weighted triangulation. So, provided that that sample is dense enough, uh, it's it's a, it's a topological ball, and it's and the boundary, the link is. Uh, uh, k minus one dimensional sphere. So we have for free that, um, almost for free, that the result is a combinatorial manifold. And then proving that it's a triangulation is a bit more of work, but uh, here is the result. Provided that the, uh, the, 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 the stars, uh, the projection embeds the star in, in each tangent space, which is trivial due to the construction. If the simplices are quality, we have bounds and edges, which is given by the net condition, and thickness, which is something we can obtain, as we, we saw, plus some condition that I won't discuss, but it's uh, also a local condition that will ensure injectivity. And provided that we have this condition that can be checked locally in the tension spaces, then we have uh, as a result that um, this is a triangulation. So there are several variants of these results, uh, depending on the, the application, but um, yes. So by using this, so I just recall what I, I just said. We first compute this local triangulation by this, uh, by observing that we don't need to compute the full triangulation to compute the restriction to tangent spaces. Then we used the stability result to make all these uh, local triangulations uh, the same because of stability, they will be the same under some sampling condition. And then, uh, um, and then the result is uh, a triangulation of the original manifold. Okay, so just an example to show that we, we have some implementation that is not that that nice but uh, still this is a surface a Riemann surface defined as the set of points that sati so these points are complex uh, numbers in the projective um, plane satisfying this equation so there are some so these data have been provided by uh, 
Aurelien Alvarez, who is interested in this uh, question. And the question was, what is the, the what is the Euler characteristic of this this uh, this surface? So we use here an embedding um, that that is defined here that gives uh, uh, a compact submanifold in R8. Okay, and then we can uh, sample that manifold and uh, reconstruct it and compute the other characteristic. Okay, so this is the, the end of the second part. Um, let me just say that there are some extensions of this work, especially here we were in the Euclidean space and use the Euclidean distance between the points, but we can also work in the case we only know uh, the distances between pairs of points, so in discrete uh, discrete setting. Um, so there are some variants of the uh, homeomorphism result, as I said. Uh, and if you are interested in the statistical aspect of this problem, you should look at Amari and Levrard uh, uh, paper, and they they, they show that. This reconstruction is optimal in some uh, statistical sense. Okay, so what remains to be done is to reconstruct stratified manifolds, so submanifolds with boundaries and stratified submanifolds. And of course, the bonds, as I already said, are not that good, so more practical uh, algorithm uh, should be um, useful. So now I, I will, so I can take some questions, if there are some questions, otherwise I will go to the next part. Okay, so it, um, there's no question. Let, let me now look at the case of uh, um, intrinsic manifolds, and in particular, the Riemannian manifolds. So first, I would like to emphasize that uh, Riemannian manifolds don't have Delaunay truncations, even if the sample, uh, if the set of points is very dense. And um, so if you look at the Euclidean case, so we have this result that if you look at two simplices, two Delaunay simplices, the red and the blue, that share a face. So imagine this is in three space, uh, so we have the result that if there is no four points on the same sphere, the, um, it's a triangulation, okay? Uh, and the observation is that if you look at any sphere, the green sphere, in the same pencil, and whose center is lies on the line segment joining the red circumcenter and the blue circumcenter, then this green ball is entirely contained in the union of the red and the blue balls. And this is the major reason, this is in fact the, 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 the argument the Lune used to prove that it's a triangulation. He was not using this lifting map as uh, I mentioned. But if you, we look at some uh, more general case, if we have a Riemannian metric, uh, this is no longer true. And the, the sphere, so let's say this is the green sphere. So we have two balls circumscribing two simplices for the so using the Riemannian metric and we take an, a third ball circumscribing the same facet common to the red and the blue simplices and because the metric may vary uh, slightly the ball can go outside of the union of the two the red and the blue balls and then we can put a point w just inside this green ball, but outside the, the red and the blue. This will have as an effect that the facet UVP will have three neighbors, not only the red and the blue, but also the green one. So three neighbors makes this impossible to embed in R3. So, uh, and, and this case can be uh, generalized and it doesn't depend on the sampling density. So. There is really an abstraction here to the existence of Delaunay triangulations for Riemannian manifolds. Okay, so 
the way we will um, we will work around this difficulty is uh, similar to what we did for submanifolds. That we will uh, define manifold by uh, an atlas of charts and coordinate charts, uh, and we will triangulate in this uh, uh, in these local uh, patches using Euclidean Delaunay triangulation. Then, assuming that the distortion uh, so we have transition functions to go from one chart to the next, and assuming that we have low, low metric distortion, we will be able to use uh, the stability result of the donate triangulation. Okay, so the, the algorithm will be very similar to the submanifold case. We will perturb the points in the local charts so that the Delaunay triangulation, so we compute the Delaunay, Euclidean Delaunay triangulation, and then we, we protect them, we make the stars compatible, and we get a combinatorial manifold, which is a Delaunay complex. Um, so Delaunay complex means that each simplex has a circumscribing ball that does not contain any vertex except the vertices of the simplex. Okay, but as for the submanifold case, we had to weight the points. So so the result is the Delaunay complex, Riemannian Delaunay complex associated to a perturbed set of points. So in the Riemannian case, we can bond the distortion using the, um, the exponential map and the Rush comparison theorem. And the last point is, so we get, we get, um, uh, uh, combinatorial manifold, and if we want uh, homeomorphism, we uh, we use what is called the barycentric coordinate map. So to any simplex, you associate uh, so a simplex in the Euclidean triangulation. <clears throat> you look at its barycentric coordinate, and you associate you associate in the Riemannian uh, Riemannian manifold the point which is unique provided that the sampling is not in that but minimizes this quantity that is the distance dm is the distance the ge geodesic distance on the manifold and so the point that minimizes so lambda i are the barycentric coordinates of the point in the simplex and this provides a point that minimizes this quantity that is the image of the point. And this barycentric coordinate map provides um, uh, homeomorphism. So the result is that provided that some um, quantities are bounded, of course, so the sampling density epsilon has to be smaller than one fourth of the injectivity radius and lambda is um, sectional curvature of the bond on the sectional curvature of the manifold. Eta is as, be, as before the separation uh, ratio, and rho not is the perturbation ratio. And then, provided these conditions are satisfied, we get total triangulation for the Riemannian uh, metric of the perturbed set of points P prime. And the barycentric coordinate is uh, well, he has a low distortion, and he, he, he provides a homeomorphism. And moreover, the the flat metric we get from the local um, triangulations stars provide a piecewise uh, flat metric on the on the manifold, which approximates well the Euclidean metric. So we have a triangulation and the metric and the, and the triangulation which approximate the original Riemannian metric. So this is um, for the theory. So this has also been implemented by uh, my student, Maël Ruxel Labé, with uh, an, well, the geodesic in the Riemannian manifold are computed by first computing a dense, uh, dense mesh and approximating geodesic 
by uh, computing in this uh, in this mesh. So on the left, you see the uh, the anisotropic or the Riemannian Brunoi diagram, and on the right, its nerve, which in this case, because of protection and everything, is a triangulation. And these are examples for surfaces. Uh, so you see here a shock on the sphere, which and here is the, the the initial isotropic triangulation, which is used to compute geodesics, and here is the anisotropic triangulation, Riemannian triangulation, the same for, uh, for a statue. Here is the Voronoi diagram and two triangulations with different number of vertices. Okay, so it's time to conclude this talk. So uh, just to summarize, uh, we, will, we have seen how to make the lunar triangulations, good triangulations by taking and nets and protecting their triangulation. And this has as consequence stability of combinatorial structure of the donate triangulation. We use randomized algorithm several times. This is a, a strong point, uh, very nice technique, easy technique. We use them to construct the donate triangulation, but also to protect them using the local Lovas lemma. Then we, we define the reach and uh, sampling conditions and sub-manifolds. And we saw that uh, uh, sampling density is enough for the homotopic reconstruction, if we just care about uh, homotopy type, but thickness and perturbation were required to get triangulation, but this is doable. And the curse of dimensionality was avoided by uh, computing triangulation whose complexity depends on uh, and mostly on the intrinsic dimension of the same manifold, which in the case of uh, machine learning is uh, important. And regarding the triangulation of manifolds, we proved the existence of um, triangulation of Riemannian tri uh, triangulation of Riemannian manifolds, provided we have um, protection and stability. Okay, so there is a question that. Uh, didn't talk about its uh, sampling. Here we always assume that the sample is given uh, and it satisfies some nice properties. So uh, we also work on the sampling question, but this, this will be for some other talk. So thank you very much for your attention. And if you have questions, I will be pleased to answer them. Okay, well, they, do people have any questions? A wonderful talk, Jean Daniel. Uh, I was you. interested in, in the end, you had some pictures of uh, surfaces where you sort of started with something that was this right at the end of the talk. Some work done by your students where you, where you started yes. that one. Uh, this the, one? The next yes. One. Yeah, the next one. Next one? Yes. Yeah, that one. So this was a, a surface, this, this PL surface here, the blue one, and then you sort of did various smoothing techniques to get it down to a very nice smooth submanifold. Well, well here we have, we have the, 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 the manifold is just a sphere in this, in the first case. Yes. And here it's a, it's a, yes, it's a triangulated uh, surface, which has been, constructed from uh, some point sets. So the sculpture has been, statue has been uh, sampled using some scanner. And then, um, and then uh, yes, we, we compute a fine triangulation like this one. And, and from, the, from this triangulation, we can compute geodesics on the, on the approximated uh, geodesics on the manifold. And then from that, we can construct the Riemannian uh, triangulation. Very nice, very nice. It's nice, but uh, uh, I think it doesn't completely answer the, the, the problem in high dimensions. Say even in three dimensions, it's a bit difficult. The, the sampling condition we, we have, the, the condition we need to satisfy to make it work are 
quite strong and uh, well making the code work is uh, is uh, is not that easy but still mile succeeded in uh, in these cases Great. Right, well, there are no other questions. Thank you very much, Sean Danielle. Terrific talk. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>